It is just a huge, huge honor for me today. I can't believe I get to podcast interview with Dr. William Preston, McGee Jr., DDS, MD, a plastic and craniofacial surgeon who founded Operation Smile in 1982 with his wife, Kathleen S. McGee, and serves as the organization's CEO. Dr. McGee has trained and mentored thousands of physicians worldwide, a featured guest on many network television programs. Dr. McGee is also a sought-after keynote speaker for corporate national meetings. In 2013, he gave one of the keynote addresses to the National Speakers Association in Philadelphia. Dr. McGee received a DDS from the University of Maryland, which was America's first dental school, um, from George Washington University Medical School, served as general surgery residency at the University of Virginia Medical School, and received the Fulbright Hayes Scholarship Grant to study in Paris, France, where G.V. Black was fun. Uh, that had been nice to go there at the same time. He then received his plastic surgery training at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. He has been awarded honorary doctorates from some of the finest universities worldwide, including the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, in 2016, he received the Eminent Persons Award from the World Information Technology and Services Alliance, was named a Disruptive Innovator in 2015 at the Tribeca Disruption Innovation Awards, was awarded the American American Society of Plastic Surgery Honorary Citation Award in 2014, the American Society of Maxillofacial Surgeons Talakozi Award in 2013, was highlighted in U.S. News and World Report issue, America's Top Leader in 2009, was given the National Medal for Peace and Friendship Among Nations in Vietnam in 2009. In 2007, UNICEF presented him with a special recognition on behalf of Operation Smile, and he received the Distinguished Service Award from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. He entered into the Plastic Surgery practice in Norfolk, Virginia in 1978 and became president of the group, which at that time was the largest private training program in the USA. In 2016, Dr. McGee stepped away from his private practice but continues to invest all of his effort into Operation Smile. And um, we did a, um, a magazine article for that dental town, um, Operation Smile. And uh, my gosh, so talk about... What was going on in your world when you and your wife, Kathleen, decided you were going to start Operation Smile? And did you have any idea in your wildest imagination how big it would get? Well, to be quite honest with you, it was just by chance. Uh, so much of what I did through the years and the education that I was privileged to get through the years was risk taking. Uh, I... Uh, Seemed like a good idea, so to speak, at the time to do what we did. And we met somebody who then introduced us to somebody who introduced us to somebody else. And everything evolved, if you would, in a way that none of us could have predicted, nor really was planned. Uh, I was in my practice, and um, <clears throat> I obviously was interested in the craniofacial reconstruction. I had had a dental degree, the medical degree and was very focused on that study with a guy named Obergeser over in Zurich, Switzerland for three months at the end of medical school, who was the guy that really started moving jaws around, lower jaw mandibles and maxillas around. And then as I got into uh, uh, the time right before my plastic surgery, went and studied with Paul Tessier in Paris, France. And that seemed uh, like a great idea. It was an incredible experience. We had four kids, five and under at the time, and a fifth on the way. And boom, we were off there. And so fast forward now, it's about 1982. And uh, I was given an opportunity to go to the Philippines with a guy named Bill Riley uh, from Houston with a group called Philplast. And um, they were doing cleft lips and cleft palates. So I said to my wife, who's got a master's in social work and master's in human development, uh, nursing background, how about uh, we go together? She said, great. And we actually took the oldest of our five kids, Bridget, who was 13 at the time. She became my scrub nurse. And, you know, we went off to the Philippines um, really selfishly, to be honest with you, to get better at doing cleft lips and cleft palates because there was a large volume we could take care of in a short time. And I think it was at that time that uh, it changed the course in the direction of our life because there were about 300 families that came in uh, begging us to take care of their child and tugging at our sleeve. And it was just horrendous. We could only take care of 40 kids and watched over 250 get sent away. And I, it was one of the most dramatic moments in my life because I had never been 
to a country outside, you know, the United States with the poverty that existed there. And, I, you know, I, it was it was impossible. There were no plans to go back to there. And on our way out, there was a lady that we ended up uh, meeting with a ripe basket of bananas cradled in her arm and her daughter, maybe eight years old, at her side with a big hole in her lip. And um, she said, I don't have anything to give you but these bananas, but I wanted to give you this gift for trying to take care of my daughter, who we had turned away. And with tears coming down this poor lady's cheeks and tears coming down our cheeks, all I could say was maybe next year, but I knew there was no next year. I knew the group we were with wasn't planning on going back there. And so Kath and I said, well, why don't we just get together a group of our friends and we'll go back and we'll take care of those kids and the world will be wonderful. Our guilt will be gone. Then we'll just go back to our lives as usual. And that was as deep as it was, to be quite honest with you. We went back and got our friends uh, to come with us, went back the next year, saw another three, 400 families, turned another couple of hundred away. Uh, our friends told their friends, their friends told their friends, and it just grew from there. So today we're active in about 30, 35 countries. We've operated on 330,000 kids about, but it's all comprehensive care to a lot of dental activity. We've always had dental teams that go with us because it's so crucial in cleft care, but also in overall health to have good dentistry involved. And then, you know, speech pathologists and psychologists and anesthesiologists, pediatricians, and really an effort to improve the overall safety of surgical care while at the same time taking care of these thousands and thousands of kids who would have never had a chance to lead a normal life. And so it's it's been a blessing to us. I, it was lucky and it just evolved because I think humans want to do good things. Well, you're incredibly um, humble to say this. I mean, my gosh, um, you can usually tell how big and successful something is just going to LinkedIn, seeing how many employees they have on, on LinkedIn and um, or how many people put it in their profile, there's 750 people um, on your um, on your LinkedIn page. I mean, that that's that's a map that, that's bigger than almost every dental company. I didn't even I didn't even know that. I, but we have about 6000 medical volunteers uh, over time that have, you know, volunteered their time to go with us. And, you know, like last year before the COVID, we put out 170 missions. Uh, and so it's it's just unbelievable how much people want to help. If you give them a platform, they're there to help you. But I mean, you're you're like say you're just a um, a humble guy. I mean, let, let me read you the um, Operation Smile uh, has provided hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of safe surgeries for those born with cleft lip and cleft palate. With more than three decades of expertise, Operation Smile creates solutions that deliver free surgery to people where it's needed most. As one of the largest medical volunteer-based nonprofits, Operation Smile has mobilized thousands of medical volunteers from a wide range of medical specialties from more than 80 countries. Operation Smile engages public-private partnerships to advance healthcare delivery, train local medical professionals to provide provide surgical care for patients in their communities, donate crucial medical equipment and supplies, and increase access to surgical care so that everyone's living um, with cleft is treated. I mean, you're like, you. I mean, you're like Mother Teresa of Calcutta in dentistry. I mean, they should replace St. Apollonia uh, with you. I mean, this turned out to be one of the biggest things. I mean, name one thing a single oral surgeon has done greater than Operation Smile. Oh, I don't think there's all sorts of great people. And, you know, I was a bad little boy, so I have to do a lot to get to heaven. I'm telling you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, so, you know, they say, to put things in perspective, that if you took the 8 billion humans and you just looked at their smartphone, um, only one in three has a smartphone, one in three just has a cell phone without an internet connection, and one in three has nothing. Um, There's, you know, the... There's always a lot of talk of inequality in America when Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk makes their billions of dollars compared to the poor people. But when you go around the world and you look at the whole herd of 8 billion people, it seems like one out of three 
um, they weren't born on the same baseball plate as we were. I mean, it's a lot harder for one out of three than uh, others. Do you agree with that? Do you see that? Yeah, I do. And I think, unfortunately, most people around the world that are in our situation don't ever get to see it. I mean, you can see it in National Geographic or stuff like that. But if you're there and you are the one that's turning that little kid away, and I'll tell you, it impacts you. And you say, my God, how blessed I am. And I think also, if you take a look at the statistics, more people die every year in the world from lack of access to surgery than die from malaria, AIDS, and TB combined every year. So you're talking about a huge population that now, you know, the WHO and, and you know, all these organizations are recognizing that. So I look upon it as a great opportunity for us right now, because through children, I think we can bring our world together because nobody's prejudiced against a child. A child's not black, white, Asian, Latino, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Hindi, a child is a child. And if you say, if we work together, all of us around the world, and we have an average of seven different countries participating in every mission that we have. So you start to bring people together through children and, and hopefully someday create a better world for all of us. Now, as the technique, the surgical techniques changed a lot in your lifetime. I remember in 87, um, when I got out of school, I saw a, um, an orthodontic surgery case, upper or lower jaw. And I thought, well, I didn't do it. The orthodontist and the oral surgeon did it. But as my patient, I referred him. I'm going to go by and check on him in the hospital, make sure he's okay. Oh, my God. It scared me so bad, I stopped referring to anybody that did that procedure. I mean, it was just brutal. And now, 30 years later, it's a lot more of a micro-surgical approach than it was in 87. Um, have you seen the same thing in your surgical world? Has it gotten faster, better, easier, higher quality, faster? Well, there's a whole evolution that any organization, any profession goes through. When I first went into practice, we didn't have things like entitled CO2 monitors, pulse oximeters. Uh, hardly any of the patients got EKG monitoring during surgery. Today, everybody does. But out there in the real world, you know, the greater majority of the world, they don't have access to the entitled CO2 monitors, the pulse oximeters. So safety in surgery is a big, big deal. And I think through the CLEP child, what we've done is we've educated people. We have huge educational programs uh, that go on so that they, when we leave, they can do the surgery, but they can also do it safely. And we've invested in equipment, supplies, all sorts of things to be one with the people that we're with and with the ministries of health that we, you know, we deal with. And so we're, we're just very, very lucky. We, there's wonderful, wonderful people all over the world who are waiting for that you know, opportunity to give high quality care. And it's just a matter of being able to reach out to them and Thanks to generous donors, we've been able to do that. So the pandemic must have, I mean, I know you did a lot of uh, um, events last year, but I, it's had to have really, uh, um, how has the pandemic affected what you do? Well, we've been very lucky. Our, our fundraising has stayed stable. Um, we do a lot virtually. I think I've worked harder now than I've ever worked in my life because I'm constantly facing a, a TV monitor or, or a computer screen, uh, talking to somebody, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, halfway around the world. But I think that uh, people want to continue to do things. Many of our countries are able to get up and get started. In Vietnam, for instance, uh, they've operated on over 1,500 kids uh, so far uh, since it all started. And and, you know, it's people that we've trained over the years who are passionate about this. Their government is strongly behind this, the Ministry of Health. And so it's, it's that union of, of all of us together through children. Um, you, how has the um, cleft lip and cleft palate changed as far as understanding uh, at, at the uh, microbiological level, the disease process, the future treatments, will it, will it be preventable anytime soon? I certainly hope so. Uh, we have the largest collection of genetic specimens of, of families with clefts in the world now. And, you know, as we hopefully will raise the money to study all this, we'll be able to find causes of clefts. Uh, and we'll also, you know, through that, be able to find other things that are included in the genetic compositions. But I can tell you that 
We know, for instance, that wood-burning stoves inside a house have a higher incidence of the moms with clefts than people who don't have that. So now we're really working with governments to get vents and uh, everything to get the, the smoke out of the house if they have wood-burning stoves. Um, we know that the malnutrition uh, and the poverty, you know, leads to an increased incidence and, and chance of that. And so there are an awful lot of things that we start to intuitively understand, and not only that can scientifically prove, uh, because we have these relationships and because of the high volume that we take care of. Um, that that is uh, so amazing. Um, one of the things um. I've noticed um, in my lifetime, like I said, I got down to school at 87, it's 2021. It seems like every decade I live, there's just less trust among the people for the great institutions of medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, government, politics, religion. And um, I could see, uh, I mean, even something simple like water fluoridation. Uh, you mentioned uh, burning the wood stove. Um, there was a people going around on social media saying that high fluoride levels, lowered IQ and everything. And they didn't realize they were talking about a country that burns their coal for electricity above ground. And, the, you know, there's 95 natural elements on earth. So when you're burning earth or wood or something like that, um, you put a lot of stuff in the smoke. But when you try to tell them about the study, like, like just try to inform them about the study that they're talking about where I talk to the authors of it and all that stuff, they just shoot you down. I mean, if you say the World Health Organization, oh, they're a shill for the Chinese. You say the Centers for Disease Control. Oh, they're a shill for the pharmaceutical. I mean, how are we going to try to restore trust so that people like you can go into another country and welcome with uh, open arms because your brand is so big with Operation Smile, the brand, the values, the mission. But how was... Planet Earth's 8 billion people, how do we restore trust in our medical and government and religious institutions? I think that we do it through tangible things and through children, because people listen to that, and we're blessed with a before and an after. Uh, and so you can show that involvement can create change. I think love, by definition, is self-sacrifice. Love is a decision to make somebody else's problem your problem. And I think that when you can show that you can take care of a child and in as little as 45 minutes totally change that child's life and the life of their family and their overall happiness, then why not do that? And I think that what piggybacks right on that uh, is the safety of surgical care. What piggybacks on that is nutrition. For instance, it is incredibly important that a child be able to suck, let's say, when they're born to breastfeed or bottle feed, but a child with a cleft can't do that. And so now we're working with, you know, birdsong peanuts and different organizations to have a peanut butter paste that we can make that will give these kids the nutrition that will then allow them to have surgery. These are all things that I guess just have come along because people can see what we can collaboratively do together. And I think that there's more and more and more of that out there to say, wow, I have an asset that will benefit this. Can I be a part of this? Can I join on? Uh, I think that's the key. I think it's just the goodness of people and it's out there. It's just a matter of communicating it. That's what you're doing. You're, you're opening up the world. Let me just tell you that imagine, let's say in dental school, we learned first thing how to do, how to make palatal plates and dentures, right? Take impressions. Well, what if we made a palatal plate to go in to close off the gap between the mouth and the nose so a child could suck? Well, I'm working now with the University of Maryland, my alma mater in dentistry, to see what we can do about revolutionizing the way we train people worldwide to be able to do things like this. So you... You said love is self-sacrifice. You have de decided to make someone else happy. How, how, it flowed off better when you said it. How, how did you say it? <laughs> I said love by definition is self-sacrifice. Love is a decision to make somebody else's problem your problem. And that's not hard to do. If you see somebody that's struggling, why not lend them a hand? You feel better. They feel better. The world is better. Uh, I mean, that's what we should be teaching our kids. 
That is um that is very profound uh because that 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 the little child I mean it, it wasn't his um problem um it just it just happened and it wasn't your problem and now you see you know all these volunteers from all over the world uh, meeting up to make this little baby's problem their problem I mean that is just they feel better for it they feel like their life is has accomplished something in a positive way why not do that. Yeah, and that was the takeaway on charity, missionary, dentistry that I've seen in my lifetime is that someone's burned out and fried and they're trying to make their house payments, car payments, Beamer payments, all the crazy stuff. And then they go away to like a Mexico missionary in Chiapas or Tanzania and they see how other people live and it's like they come back and they've like seen Nirvana or something. And, uh, and this happened to myself that where. I went back quickly and I took my four kids and I'll never forget their um, Eric Gray Ryan and Zach. I think they were six, four, two and newborn. And the six year old goes down there and his first uh, statement to me was dad, how come they don't have trampolines? <laughs> and I thought, man, how first world are you? Or you just noticed none of the yeah. kids had trampolines, but I also noticed this though. And th this is what I struggle with. When I go to see really, really poor areas, uh, whether it be Kathmandu, the flavella at um, Rio de Janeiro, the graveyard in Egypt, it seems like they're happier. You seem, you seem more giggling. And then when you're trying to get on the subway in South Korea, Tokyo, um, New Jersey, I mean, you go to these first rich world countries with the highest median income, and you don't see a lot of happiness, giggling, laughing. I remember when I was in Kathmandu one time, I uh, leaned back and I bumped my head on this sign and it was kind of flexible tin and it sounded like a bong drum. And oh my God, people were laughing a hundred yards away. I mean, they just seem to be happier. Do you notice that or do you not see that? No, I, I see. I think that when you go to do something that has value, uh, it inherently opens your mind to things. Now, as I might have mentioned, we have five children. We had five kids in seven years. Our oldest daughter was 13 when she was my scrub nurse uh, in the Philippines, cutting, you know, handing me instruments and all that kind of stuff. She came back and with her friends started a club at her high school called the Happy Club, which now has evolved into the Operation Smile Club that has about 18,000 students in it. We bring two high school kids on every trip. Now, why do we do that? We have youth conferences every summer. 800 kids signed up with, to go to Beijing within two days, 600 to go to Rome within a couple of days. Why do they flock to these summer conferences? It's because I think our, our population is yearning to see things that they can do that are tangible, that they know that they can make a result out of. And I think our future is our children. So to not include our kids, just like you included your kids, in that understanding is a mistake because unless we expose them, they're not going to understand. You're not going to sit home and say, kids, do you realize how lucky you are? Look at this national geographic magazine. That's never going to happen. But boy, you put them in that environment and they can help, but come back and every one of our children, when we, and we've never twisted their arms. Every one of them continues to help us incredibly uh, today. You know, um, I think when dentists get burned out and, um, you know, for years in the 80s, they used to say, oh, dentistry has the highest suicide rate. But it was a 19 year war in Afghanistan where obviously the soldiers um, have the highest suicide. rate. I think it's like 26 a day. Dentists aren't even close. But I would always ask the dentist, well, let's go back to that place um, in the seventh grade when you decided you want to be a dentist. What were you thinking then? How, how can we get back to where that was your best idea? And I wanted to ask you, um, why did you become a dentist? And, and you're, you're a dentist and an MD. You're a DDS MD. Um, but why? Talk, tell us about your journey of how you ended up a dentist and a physician and an oral well, surgeon. My dad was a surgeon. He was, um, you know, out of medical school, a year out of medical school. When he went to World War II, he was in charge of an army hospital that went from Southern France up to Austria. Um, and he was always a guy that never talked about the negative side of anything. In fact, I never heard him talk about the war at all. And I found out when he died that he had had a bronze star. 
but you know, he, he had a very, very busy practice and learned how to do general surgery. Um, and so I almost became an electrician because I loved construction. And I would have done that had not my high school principal called Mount St. Mary's College and asked them to take me. Uh, and so I ended up going to college and then was good friends with a guy that um, was going to dental school. And I was thinking about going to medical school, but he said, look, we can get a year off medical school because we have good grades. I mean, dental school, we can get a year off dental school because we have good grades. And um, so we only have to go three years to college and I hated to study. So I said, man, sounds good to me. And I'm still in my own practice and I'll be in healthcare. And so that's how I ended up at the University of Maryland um, there to study dentistry. And I loved it. I was gonna go into oral surgery, maxillofacial surgery, when another guy who sat next to me for all those years of dental school said, hey, Bill, we can get a year off medical school because of our dental degree. Uh, what do you think? And I thought three years of oral surgery, three years of uh, you know medical school, they're the same. I didn't even think about the seven years of residencies after that and everything. And so it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so I ended up applying to GW, George Washington University, to medical school. I said to my wife, what do you think? And she said, fine with me, if it's okay with you. And so ended up going to medical school, got my medical degree, uh, and then went into all these years of residency studying in, in, um, in Zurich, Switzerland, with the guy that started the sagittal splits and the maxillary osteotomies, a guy named Obergeser, and then ended up um, after my plastic, before I, um, actually before I started my plastic, go study with Tessier over in Paris, France. Uh, who was the guy that was the father of craniofacial surgery um, and spent six months with him and it came out. So I was, I enjoyed construction, which is what I was doing, doing construction on people's heads uh, and mouths. And I enjoyed medicine and I enjoyed helping people and it just all worked for me. So 17 years after high school, I finally went into my practice, but I, I never worried about money, so to speak. I just, you know, worked on the side and did all sorts of things to make our way through it. But it was it was a gift to me. And it's a beautiful, beautiful profession, dentistry, medicine. And I was lucky enough to step into the right place at the right time, have the right wife who loved the challenges of it all. And if it wasn't for her, there wouldn't have been an Operation Smile like it is today. That is... Uh... I, I just saw uh, it's just amazing um, um, what you've done. I mean, um, we believe every child has the right to smile. Together we can change forever. Uh, the other quote that you're saying, uh, we believe love is making someone else's problem, your problem, operation smile. I mean, uh, my gosh, um, is the um, is the te is the surgery itself? I was surprised when I was reading about you that it's a 45 minute surgery. I mean, I. I, I can remember it in the 80s being, um, seeing the first one I saw was like three hours. Is that well, 45 minutes? A, is that something new? Yeah, it's as little as 45 minutes. It can take longer at times uh, than that. But it's the thing is, it's very tangible. Uh, you know, you have to develop the skill sets to do it. You have to enjoy fine motor skills. Um, that's why I wanted to go into construction in the beginning. I enjoyed that kind of stuff. And I just applied it, I guess, in the medical arena. Uh, but I was very, very blessed to train with great people. And all of that stuff was by chance. I mean, I just wrote to these people and said, would you mind if I come and study with you? And they said, yes. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, how many people do it. I can remember my buddy from medical school, uh, that told me to go to medical school. He, um, was there when I was writing a letter to Obergeser, who was really, really famous for doing the mandibular maxillary osteotomies. And um, he said, what are you writing to him for? He'll never say yes to you. He said, I said, Steve, it's going to cost me a stamp. <laughs> if he says no, he says no, who cares? And so a couple of weeks later, I got back a letter and said, sure, we'd love to have you come over here and spend three months. And, you know, it's that you can't be afraid to take the chance uh, and to do what you think you'll love to do. And what advice would you give to these kids? I mean, 
Um, they're obviously looking at older people like us saying, oh, well, Howard, you got out in 87. Those were the golden years, and, and it was so much easier to be a dentist, and student loans were cheaper. Now student loans are much higher. Um, there's uh, a lot more competition. Um, they were in the middle of a pandemic. And last year's COVID class of 2020, they were coming out of school about $400,000 in debt in the middle of a pandemic with no jobs and no one wanting to go uh, to the dentist. Um, you've been around the world more times than anyone can count. What advice would you give them? I would say don't worry about money. My parents had this philosophy that after college, you're on your own. Whatever you want to do, you pay for. And we found a way to, to work and to earn the money and to do the things that we needed to do. Uh, I've never worried about money per se. I mean, it, obviously, you had to have enough to live and to do those kind of things. But I don't think it's, it'll all work out. You just got to want to do what you want to do. And I'd say 25% of my private practice was for free. I would never, ever turn anybody away because of lack of money or anything like that. Because I felt that I have a responsibility to take care of that. And as a result, my practice grew like crazy. But I didn't do it so that my practice would grow. I did it because I thought it was morally right to do that. And I, I think medicine gives you that opportunity. Uh, it's a beautiful profession. Dentistry is a beautiful profession. And I don't think we should ever take for granted the gift we were given by getting those degrees. And I wish, um, I hope the um, DSO management people are listening to this because uh, they're, uh, you know, they're 18% of the dentists in Arizona work for a DSO. And what you just said was one of the last straws that makes dentists quit because when the dentist quits, I mean, um, you know, that it, it's hard to build a brand when every time the patient goes there, it's a different dentist. And they'll want to do charity. They'll say, oh, on this next patient, they're having real hard times. I've been back in the room with them for an hour. So when I do this tooth, I'm going to have the whole area numb. I'm going to do the tooth in front of and behind it just for free since I'm in there anyway. It's already numb. And the DSL will say, well, you're absolutely not going to do that. That is against our policy. And you start telling a doctor of dental surgery that they can't do volunteer dentistry in their own backyard in someone in need. I mean, what do you think a dentist is? I mean, it's, um, they, they have to understand that that's just, uh, that's crazy. We, we need to bring those people with us to the developing, you know, to the world that's out there that is incredibly poor and let them realize the beauty of the dental profession and what they do. Do you know that, uh, you know, in, in in that world, a lot of people can die from oral infections, as you know, uh, and it can cause, you know, uh, infection in the brain. And, uh, you know, it, it's really serious stuff to have an infected tooth in there that's not taken out. So you're saving people's lives uh, with dentistry and, and they should never, ever forget that. How do you, um? how does it make you feel? And does it scare you? Like, like, look at Bill Gates. He, um, he started Microsoft, he, um, this big company, and then he decided he was going to take all of his fortunes and start being a philanthropist, and he's doing all these things that are really helping the world at a huge level, yet a quarter of Americans think he's trying to put a chip in their head, and, and, uh, and these, these are some of my, my, my family members and cousins. Um, I mean, he's... I mean, I can't believe he's done so much for so many and a quarter of the people just think he's like the worst guy in the world. And he's, you know, um, he's he created the va the, the pandemic because he wants to sell the vaccine and he wants to sell the vaccine to put a, a chip in your head. I mean, how how do you um, how, how does that make you feel? Because, it, you know, one day they could be accusing you of causing this whole thing like a conspiracy. I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can get consumed with negativity uh, at any level. I think that you have to continue to think positively about life. There'll always be negativity out there uh, and there'll always be the naysayers that do it. I think that you have to do what you emotionally know is the right thing to do, intuitively know that you should be doing things like this and then be proud of what you do. And um, don't worry about about that stuff, because it's not going to help anybody to try and combat it, to try and naysay it. It's not going to help. I, I think there's so many great people in our world. And, you know, some of them give $10 a month to us. 
But think of, of, you know, you get enough people to do that, you have a lot of money to help other people. Uh, there's good people everywhere. And I think you have to celebrate the goodness in people, not worry about the negativity. That's, um, you're just not going to lower yourself to their levels, what you're saying. It's like, if you, if you want to go there, I can't follow you. I mean, that is uh, profound. Um, due to this, back to this baby that needs a surgery for uh, cleft lip, cleft palate. Um, why did it end up, I mean, maybe it sounds obvious to you, you're a dentist and an AMD, but why did it end up with oral surgeons and dentists? Why didn't it end up with ENTs or, or other types of head and neck surgeries? How did it end up an oral surgery dental thing? I don't know the right answer. It, it was probably the focus you had. Um, and then maybe your mentors that were doing stuff like that, that motivated you to do it. There are some ENT people that do it. Um, but it, it's, I think it's, you know, as I said, we have five kids now. I, uh, the, my, our oldest son is a DDS and an MD. Uh, and my son-in-law has an M, MD. And one of, another son of mine has an MD who's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, the ones that are orthopedic surgeons, my son-in-law, my son, they also go out and do things to help people with joint replacements uh, that don't have the assets in a, like a Guatemala or in, um, in their inner city areas. Um, my son, Billy, is the head of uh, international plastic surgery at, at uh, LA Children's Hospital. And he has a huge role in a lot of the work that's being done, as well as the research and educational part of it. Um, if you take a look at uh, our, two, our, our two daughters, one has a, a nursing degree, the other um, has a um, uh, master's in social work uh, or in psychology, and both of them are intimately involved in the stuff that we do, uh, one with the student programs and one with the strategic planning. We never said that they should do that. It was almost part of the family ethic um, that they grew up with because we probably had a hundred patients stay in our home from overseas uh, that have big, big problems, uh, like a 37 pound tumor coming off the side of the head um, that we had to bring them here to take care of them. We couldn't safely take care of them in their home country, but they live with us. And our kids had to give up their bed and sleep on the third floor in a mattress while these families were there. But it was beautiful for our kids because it really brought home the fact that they too could share what they had with others. Well, you know, I, I, I just really, really recommend um, missionary dentistry, charitable dentistry. Um, do, do you consider this missionary dentistry or charitable dentistry? Missionary is kind of more associated with a religion and charity is more economics. Do you? Does Operation both Smile? Of those, both of those words have negativity associated with them at, at some level. I just think uh, it's love in its most simplistic form. I mean, if you see someone that has a need and you have the talent to help them and you're willing to give some of your time to put a hand out to someone in need, you end up feeling like a better person and you do good things. And so I try to, we stay away from politics and religion all the time because all positive religions talk about helping one another. Uh, politics is only alienating to people. And so you're not going to win, win with that. We were the first Americans to ever go back to Vietnam after the war. And it was a buddy of mine from high school at my 25th high school graduation in New York City on the, you know, on, on the uh, East River, sharing a beer at three o'clock in the morning that said, would you consider bringing Operation Smile to Vietnam because they won't talk to us and they won't return our missing in action soldiers. I said, sure, if we can. So he introduced us to General Vesey who was the head of the Joint Chiefs at the time under Reagan. And we ended up going in 1988 to Vietnam. We were the first Americans to go back in there. Um, now, 30 years later, we have this great relationship with the Vietnamese. And within three months of our first mission there in 89, the missing in action uh, bodies started coming back to the United States. What was that? It was because we developed a relationship through children with their government. And it, it's so simple to understand our world's never going to get changed by our leaders. Um, it's just not going to happen. It's not their personality types, but the world can get changed through children. 
And if we all just extend ourselves to not worry about race, religion, cultures, politics, and just do it for the right reason, then it'll work. Great advice. And um, yeah, I when people get all excited that some new change in leadership is going to change the world, and it's like, okay, get back with me in 10 years. I mean, it's just always the same. Um, but I'll never forget what my... Um, Sisters, I mean, I was trying to find it for you, and I can't, uh, I can't find it. Um, where was it? Um, but anyway, it was um, my oldest sister is fluent in all the languages that all the major religions of Hinduism, um, Buddhism, Confucius, Christianity, Judaism, and um, she's read them all in their original languages, and she was a translator uh, for Rome. But she said in all the major works of religion, there wasn't a single name of a person, place, or thing that shows up in every one. And the only one uh, that uh, shows up everywhere uh, in every major religion was the golden rule um, to treat other people like you want to be treated. And she go, she went off on it. In fact, she gave me the uh, the quotes. I got to find that uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but, but basically, she says it's so close that scholars would say it was plagiarism. I mean, it's like, okay, this person cheated on the other person. And that just kind of sums up all religion. Just and, and a lot of times dentists are working at a clinic and they get on dental town and they say, well, I'm owned by a, a big group practice and they're saying, I need to do this. And what do you think? Do you think I should do this? And the question is like, well, would you want some dentist to do that to you? I mean, you should be able to answer this in six seconds. I mean, would you want some dentist to do that to you? And that's where I find myself in my career that my four boys that I made in 60 months, um, now they're all out of the house and now they got seven dependents. And when I look at dentistry, I don't care about my own teeth. I'm just thinking about what is dentistry going to look like when I'm gone and my grandkids go to a dental office? I don't want them going to a dental office that's owned by Wall Street, some MBA, and trying to make quarterly numbers and saying, well, don't do a filling, do a crown. It's a thousand. I mean, if, if the insurance companies own the dental clinics, if Wall Street owns the dental clinics, where are my grandchildren going to go when they need a dentist? Well, I think we, all of us have to do what's right to do. And it's in our ethic. And a lot of that is built in the family that raises you. And so if you get raised with values that are pure values, and ideally, everybody does, the, you know, in, in, in the ideal world, you would hope that. But the more that parents can espouse to values, and no matter what profession you go into, to accentuate the importance of those values of helping one another, the better the world will be. Uh, if, if we don't espouse to those values, how do we expect the people that lead our insurance companies or our you know, bureaucracies to be able to promote it because then they don't have a constituency to talk to? So I think it's, it's you know, for every dentist who watches this, I say to them, make sure, man, that you're taking care of somebody who needs your help and don't be afraid to tell your kids what you're doing uh, so that they'll grow to respect the fact that that's part of the, your family ethic. I found the slide. Um, Judaism, 2000 BC, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary, the Talmud. Um, Hinduism, 1500 BC, this is the sum of all true righteousness. Deal with others thou wouldst thyself be dealt by, the Mahabharata. Buddhism, 500 B.C., hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Confucius, 500 B.C., surely it is the maxim of loving kindness do unto others that you would have them do unto you. Christianity is um, the turn of the millennium, do unto others you would have done unto you. That's Luke. Um, and then Islam, 500 A.D., no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. I mean, it's really kind of easy um, to be a good person you just have to treat other people like you want to be treated and and i want to ask you this question and i know we never talk about religion sex politics and violence but it's just so obvious um all around the world people talk about income inequality um when it talks to healthcare, you're a double doctor you're a dentist an md oral surgeon um, some countries like our neighbor canada they have a um like what our 
Senior citizens have Medicare uh, for everyone over 65. Canada has Medicare for everybody. And um, some people um, see that as an affront on freedom and socialism and all that stuff. How, how do you see the delivery of health care around the globe? Do you think, um, do you think, big government Medicare socialism programs are better? Do you think they're, um, they're not as good? And how would you address getting more health care to the one in three people that doesn't even have a cell phone or a smartphone? Well, what we have to do is we have to change the delivery model to some extent because a lot of the things that we do, whether it's in medicine or dentistry, uh, don't require the level of education that you and I went through to get there. And so you can train people to do certain things without all that education and build up that infrastructure to help. The other thing is, I think that as individuals, it's too big a topic to decide how you're going to change it on a, um, on a countrywide scale or a worldwide scale. It's just, you got to take each step along the way to make it happen. And you got to you know, do what you can as an individual and set the exposure. If you take a look at the leaders that have really made significant imaging in our lifetime, whether it's Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Christ or Nelson Mandela, most of those individuals, except Nelson Mandela, maybe weren't in politics, but they espoused to a value and that value was the thing that sold. That's why their names are, are all the way out there. We've got to have our leaders exposed to values, not necessarily dictums or not policies, but values. And I think if we can start selling those values as what's right, um, then you stand a chance uh, of getting it done. But tomorrow, we're not going to change anything tomorrow. We have to, got to set the example for our kids and our grandkids about the way we want our world to be. Well put. And I tell you the other thing about missionary um, dentistry. Anytime I've gone on a missionary dental trip, the um, a dental school you know, sent some of their kids to go with us. And every time I've ever done this, the old guys are sitting on the other side and talking to ourselves saying, my God, those are the best kids I've ever seen. And what's really weird about dentistry is look at look at presidencies. I voted for the first time in 1980, and I've always said that the job of every new president is to make him look worse than the one before. It's, it's, they've just been going down the stairway for 40 years, and dentistry is the opposite. It's like it seems like every graduating class, they're just better. They're they're more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and their heart's in the right place. And I feel kind of um, giddy that these this is what our profession is attracting. I mean, it looks like the cream of the crop is going into dentistry and medicine as opposed to going to Wall Street and trying to make, you know, a million gazillion dollars. I mean, I'm so impressed with the people we're attracting. And a lot of that's because of guys like you. I mean, you're really sitting uh, determining the brand of dentistry, of medicine, of surgeons where, I mean, you, you, you've corrected 300 thousand people i mean the, the, the average dentist has two thousand patients operation smile has fixed three hundred thousand children's teeth uh, uh issues in um in 80 countries i mean my gosh think about it though think about what could be and think about the fact that what if we were able to start a movement if you would i would appeal to the philanthropist the person who has been incredibly successful, what if they came to us and said, look, I would like to start a program with the University of Maryland Dental School, and I would like to donate three months, let's say, or a month of their educational career and pay for them to go to one of your countries to help people. And I want to give every kid who goes into that school the opportunity to go and to do that. I mean, that would cost a, a lot of money, but in the big picture, it would embed those philosophies that you're talking about because hands-on, they would see the need and you would, you would grow that caring population of, of healthcare professional. Uh, you know, we could do that. We can put people out there like that. We have the contacts 
we have the, you know, the recognition of the ministries of health that would enjoy having these people come out and be an extra arm and do it respectfully to the people that are in their communities in these countries right now. Uh, not in a way of coming in and saying, look, I know this stuff and I'm better than you. It's no, let us work together and I can share what I know. You share with what you know and all together we'll have fun. We'll enjoy ourselves. We'll be have a product that is visual and, and we know we've helped somebody and I'll come back to my community a better person. I, I mean, those are the kind of things that I would like to see philanthropy philanthropists really start to invest in. And we're here to do that. That's one of our goals now is to continue to improve overall surgical care through the face of these children. So as we're taking care of these children, we're augmenting the education and the safety of all of surgical care so that when we leave, someone comes in with a broken arm or an appendicitis, they can get safe surgical care because we were taking care of the kids in their community with cleft lips or cleft palates. I remember the first time we did a missionary dental trip, you know, we're tunnel vision, we're dentists, we're looking in their mouth, you know, we're looking at their hot teeth or whatever. And then I started realizing, my gosh, there's a whole body attached to this person. And then we started looking at all these other things. So we drove into town and found a physician that we could hire for four days to drive him back to the village. Because at times I thought, you're kind of crazy, Howard, you're, you're fixing some guy's broken tooth and his foot is swollen up the size of a football. I don't really think the tooth is the issue, but we do get tunnel vision. And um, I, um, I wanted to ask you this historic uh, question. The first president of the American Dental Association was just like you. He was a DDS and an MD. And so was the second president of the American Dental Association. The current president um, is right here out of Tucson. And um, he also is an oral surgeon with an MD and a DDS. Um, you went to the first dental university in America, Baltimore. Do you think, looking back, they should have kept dentistry and medicine in the same school? There's rumors that say that the dentist needed the patient sitting up, the physicians needed a bed laying down. Who knows how it, it got... Um, um, diverged apart, but it seems like with the oral systemic link and so many things that they're they're trying to pull it back together. So my question succinctly is, why was the first president of the ADA a DDSMD? The current one is, and do you think we should have stayed together? And do you think um, we should head these two professions back to the same place? I, I, here's what I think. I, I, I think people go into what they go into because of their love of what they're doing. I think that Dentistry is an critical, critical part of overall health, as is medicine. I think that the evolution of where you go depends on what you love doing and whatever you love doing, do it well. I think it's inconsequential whether you have a medical degree, a dental degree, or lots of other things that you could be involved with, with overall health systems. I think the key is, is to use your talents that you have to the best of your ability to help others. And don't be afraid to talk about the goodness of the professions of medicine, dentistry, or nursing, or whatever it is. We all need to appreciate the passion that an individual has to have to go into those in the beginning. Then we have to use that passion to the best of our creativity to amplify it every day to help people. So that's up to the individual. And we have to tell, you know, we have to somehow embed in them the understanding that everybody is capable of amplifying what we do to the next level. Um, my gosh, that, that's, uh, that's poetry. I, I, I don't even want to say anything after that to, to ruin it. Um, so I'll, I'll just say this. I can't believe we're coming up on an hour, but um, I know this sounds like a silly question, but so why is there an operation smile today? You know, in economics, they say, well, if the market has a failure, the government should step in. That was Keynesian economics. I mean, so my question is, why is there an operation smile today? I think it's because people all over the world are good. I think it's because people want to do good things. And they, um, all of us need to see something tangible in what we do. We're blessed in that the product that we have is very tangible. You can see a before and the after, but 
you know, let's say if I were to just talk about anesthesia, which is critical to safe surgical care, if I say anesthesia, people in their own mind see a person going to sleep and waking up. They don't realize the expertise that's necessary to have safe anesthesia. If you start talking about machinery that's necessary, if you start talking about ICU nursing or preoperative, postoperative care, if you talk about speech pathology, dental technicians, dentists, dentistry, if you talk about all those kind of things, each of them have their own subset. But if they're all working together to produce an excellence in whatever they do, then that excellence will flow through into the community. We can't be afraid to be proud of what our knowledge base is, not in a braggadocious way, but in a way that we're proud to share it with other people and teach them and encourage them to do things that will help another human being, just like we should be encouraging the businessman which we do to use their assets to help another human being. The more that we combine each of our genetic predispositions together for the concern of another human being, the better our world will be. And that's the evolution of humanity. And we've got to be a little piece of that puzzle in our own communities and in our own countries and our own world. And again, if you lost it, there, there's a, a dental consultant in um, Phoenix here named Greg Stanley, and just a master dental consultant of turning dental offices around. And one of his big secret ingredients is a missionary uh, trip to Haiti, where he's with his organization where he can send someone on any given month. And he says, he says, it's just the cure-all. He says, this dentist has all these problems and he's bouncing off the walls and he's crazy. So I first send him to Haiti for a week. And then he comes back with his tail between his legs and says, Okay, I was being kind of irrational, wasn't it? I mean, it was a it was a major part. So, what would you um, say to any kids listening to you that are all fired up and salivating and want to have purpose and mission and want to get involved with Operation Smile? What could they do next? Would they go to OperationSmile.org? dot org? Um, yeah, they do that and just say that they want to be involved. Say that they're a student. They want to get engaged and get involved. We have people who talk to them. I mean, we have a huge student program. I don't know of another medical mission that uh, since the beginning, we bring two high school kids on every trip. I mean, people say, high school kids? What are you talking about bringing high school kids? What do they know? I can tell you these kids never forget it. They come back and they end up saying, my God, I can't believe it. I'm going to have to listen to my fellow high school students moaning and groaning. When what I saw, they have no realize how, how lucky they are. And, and I think it's that education at a formative stage that really programs you to go into something meaningful with your life. I, I, I you know, and anybody who wants to start a high school program in their school will help them um, because it's a win-win for everybody. And if we can see more kids during the formative stages of their minds and, and education start to put a place in there for using your education to help another human being, then our world will be a better world. It sounds so simple to me, but it's so true. Well, I want to ask the question, but it might be too personal, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and you can just say, go away. But um, how has this affected your marriage, uh, you and Kathleen? I mean, this oh, is, I mean, you had five kids. That's a huge commitment. Operation Smile, that's, beyond a commitment. How did this um, affect you and your wife? Well, we're going on 53 years of marriage. And, um, you know, it's, it definitely is unifying. It, it gives each of us an opportunity to be who we are. Kath has a nursing degree and a couple of master's degrees, um, one in, um, in education and one in uh, social uh, work. Uh, and so right from the very beginning, I mean, boom, she was engaged with this. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I, I had the degrees I had, but I think the blessing that we had is that both of us were passionate about this early on, uh, but neither of us wanted to own it, so to speak. We knew that the only way it would grow is to share it with whoever we could. Uh, and then it just started to grow, but we never planned for it to be as big as it is. 
And what we realized very early on was that you had to get people around you who had different skill sets than you did for it to grow. You had to get the business mind behind you. You uh, had to get all the different, you know, technical minds behind you. And it was the amalgamation of all these thought processes that allowed the organization to grow. It's we're still working 60 to 80 hours a week, um, you know, keeping everything going. But we're more, I guess you would say, we're a catalyst in a way to get other people engaged and involved who have skill sets maybe that we don't to keep moving it along. So it hadn't hurt our marriage at all, by the way. I mean, there's no way that we uh, even ever, ever even thought about that. It's the first time I've ever gotten that question, to be honest with you. Huh, because it's, it's such a commitment and some commitments can bring a family closer together and some commitments were the straw that broke the camel's back and it created too much uh, chaos or whatever. But uh, that is, uh, congratulations on 53 years. Uh, that is my, uh, that, that is an amazing deal. Um, was there anything that you thought we were going to talk about today that I didn't bring up or that you wanted to mention or? No, not really. I mean, um, we're kind of an open book and it's easy to talk about anything, whether it's philosophical or whether it's medical or dental or any of those things. But I think the most important thing is to encourage the people that listen to this, that if they know people that might be enticed to get into this and the business community who could help us. I mean, we have great relationships with Johnson and Johnson, with uh, Stryker, with a lot of medical pharmaceutical companies. I think the public wants to see goodness. They want to see tangible results. And I think if we could get the, so to speak, Bill Gates of the world uh, behind us, there is so much that more that we could do uh, with the investments in so many things that we've seen that there's a need to be, and through children, be able to have the respect and the relationships in countries. One of the things is that We've never been kicked out of a country. Obviously, we're in a lot of countries that politically and philosophically are different than the United States, like Vietnam, let's say. But we have the total, total respect of the Vietnamese government. In fact, Lee Duc An, who was the president when we were uh, beginning back in 1988 in Vietnam, um, just died. And they did a video about him. And they said Lee Dukan was a different type of president. He didn't rule by usual politics. He, um, he ruled by a different way through children. And he was the one that brought Operation Smile into Vietnam and helped the children of Vietnam. And that's how the relationship re was reestablished between the United States and Vietnam. For the memorial to that president, for them to mention Operation Smile and children, gives you an idea of how powerful children are in bringing people together. And, you know, obviously the United States and Vietnam didn't philosophically agree on a lot of things, but never once did we have ever have a problem with working together and helping the children of that country. That is amazing. And do you think when it's all done and said, do you think the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, my mom always swears that something good comes out of everything and she was, uh, she believes that uh, biggest thing in the world. Uh, do you think the pandemic um, still has the opportunity to bring the world together to a closer place? Or do you think there will be inequalities? Like we started with a cell phone where one out of three has a smartphone, one out of three has a cell phone and one out of three has nothing. Do you, do you think one out of three aren't going to get any kind of a vaccine or do you think um, the world's going to try to get this um, for everyone? Well, hopefully, you know, people will will be fair and equitable in the distribution of those kind of things, and people will come along to help that situation financially. But the world is what it is. I mean, you know, there are volcanoes that erupt. There are, you know, earthquakes that occur. There are disasters that occur. It's It's how we respond to the disasters and how we come together that makes the difference. That's an example of what could be done in the future. And so we can't be afraid uh, of the disaster, so to speak, that what we have to do is what did we learn from it? And then how can we grow to be a better individual and a better culture and a better country than we were before? 
And, and I think if we keep that positivity, then we'll grow. If we start trying to think negatively about it, then that doesn't help us at all. Well, on that note, I, I think you can't end on anything better than that. Um, thank you for all that you've done. I mean, for oral surgery, for dentistry, for medicine, for your 300,000 patients, for starting Operation Smile, which is far bigger than you let on at all. I mean, it's just a massive, massive thing. I, I remember going into details on this when we were doing the uh, uh, Dentaltown article back in um, – um, uh, for Operation um, Smile. I mean, it's just what you've done. It's it's really, it's just amazing. It, it was it was just a huge honor to even podcast interview. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Let me reinforce that it isn't what I did or Kath did. It's it's what I guess the people that we introduced it to, what they did with their skills and their talents that made it what it is today, and it's the amalgamation of all that through a common sense of purpose that transcends, you know, patting yourself on the back by any stretch of the imagination. All right. Well, I hope Bill Gates uh, hears his podcast and, and, uh, <laughs> and gets his buddy Warren Buffett in uh, Omaha. And uh, I hope you get more resources because that's what you need. Thank the you so much Larry, for coming on today. The more resources we have, the more kids we can take care of, the more we can spread the word with individuals like yourself. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.